Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to GCC. We are here in the building. Doesn't it feel good? Again and again, week in, week out, we have been in the building now. For those of you at home, if you haven't managed to be here yet, really be here. Get yourself here. It's a great atmosphere. And everybody here, I can see smiling behind their masks. Of course, I can see the joy on their faces. Well, it's great to be here. We're going to have a great Sunday. I just want to read to you something that for me is always uh, very relevant when we think about being here together like this. And we know it very well, you should know it very well. Uh, those of you who have uh, been in this world, this Christian world of ours, this Christian life, doing the journey for some time, you know this very well. Psalm 84, verse 10 tells us this. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Better is one day in your house. At least one day in his house. I like to think that actually we can have every day in his house, in his presence room, when we think about it. And so today we've got one opportunity to be in his house together as the church. So let's stand, we're going to worship now. Those of you at home, you just pray that you're going to be able to plug into this and enjoy this just as well with us too. We're all together as one as the church. Amen? Let's just pray and then we'll get into it. Lord, we just want to commit this time to you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your name. Ultimately, you, Lord, get the glory. So we want your name to be raised, your name to be lifted high. Ultimately, all glory, all praise goes to you. And it is you are the one thing that unites us all, Lord. So we just thank you for that. And Lord, we want to honor you today. Amen. Thank you. 
We believe that God is preparing us for the time of preparation, for a journey that he's got for us. And there's a, I'm a Disney fan, um, and there is a film, Pocahontas, the Disney version of Pocahontas. There's a song in it that's called Just Around the River Bend. Just Around the River Bend. Because you see, here we've got Pocahontas, and she's got a decision to make. Because she can choose to marry Kokomo, I think I said it right, but who the, um, her own dad wants her to marry, who's this strong warrior who can provide for her and keep her safe. But Pocahontas has been having a dream, a dream that's making her believe that something is coming, something different, something new, and she doesn't know what to do. Does she do what her dad wants her to do and what everybody expects her to do and keep doing the normal what everybody else is doing? Or does she wait? Does she wait for what's coming? For what's just around the river bend? And in good old Disney style, there is plenty of songs in this film. And in the song about just around the river bend, the lyrics go, what I love about, what I love most about rivers is you can't step in the same river twice. The water's are always changing, always flowing. But people, I guess, can't live like that. We all must pay a price. To be saved, we lose our chance of ever knowing what's around the river bend, waiting just around the river bend. Because if we play life too safe, then we're never gonna find out what's coming because we're too busy keeping with the norm, keeping with what's expected of us. But we believe as a church that God is saying there's something coming. We don't know what it is. We can't touch it yet. But there is something coming just around the river bend. So because of this, in June, we are going to be doing a whole theme about journeys. We're going to be tightening it just around the river bend, knowing that something is coming for us as individuals and as a church. And throughout the month of June, we're going to be looking at different journeys in the Bible that people have taken and what we can learn from them in preparation for us as a church as we get ready for what God has got for us. So we invite you to join us as we look at all of these journeys in the Bible. And today, as part of our preparation for what's happening in June, I want us to kick us off because I'm very aware of what you get out of this teaching will be a lot to do with your perspective, with what you're already deciding about this thing, with what you're already seeing. Because we decide as human nature by you know, our human nature, by what we see and the experience we've, experiences we've had, that we already make our mind up over things. So as you're hearing about us talking about something coming, you could be sitting there going, oh, I've heard it all before. Whatever, here we go again. Or some of you could be sitting there and you could be like, yeah, something's coming and I'm getting about it because you see we're all different in this room we will all be looking at this in a different way so today i want us to look at what perspective we have and we're going to be looking at a journey the two people taking the bible the same journey but they both had a different perspective and at the end of their journey they both testify about the faithfulness of god because even though we might view things different even though i might see things differently to you and you're seeing things differently me, we can all do this journey together. We can still see what God has got for us together, but we need to be open to what God is doing. Because you see, we learn about the dangers of having the wrong perspective when we read Numbers 13, where Moses sends out 12 spies to go and look into the promised land. These 12 spies all see the same thing. They see the glorious land. They see how fantastic it is. They get excited about what they are seeing, but they also see giants. They also see danger. They see trials. And they look and they're like, look at look what we're seeing. It's great, but look. And there's that but. So when they come to Moses and they tell him what they've seen, 10 spies cannot get over the trials, the effort it would take the dangers that are in that land. That was their perspective. That is what they saw. So they come back and they tell Moses, yeah, it's great, but we can't do it. The timing's not right. It, it, it's, the giants are there, we're not ready. Because you see, their perspective is on what they feel they can do, on their own abilities, and where they feel they're at, and how much power and strength they feel they've got. So when they saw the giants in the promised land, when they saw the trials, when they saw the hardship, what they did is they said, you know what, I'm just going to stop here a minute because, well, there's efforts and there's trials and, and, it's, and it's hard and I don't think we're ready for it yet. So we're just going to wait. We're going to wait until the timing is 
right. We're going to wait until we feel we've got this in us, that we can do it. We're just going to perch and wait. But you see, as children of God, we cannot stay in this place. We cannot stay perched. We cannot stay just sitting down and waiting until the timing feels right. Waiting until we feel strong enough for what's ahead of us. Waiting until everything fits perfectly into place. Because you see, there was ten spies that were willing just to perch. But then there were two spies, two, Joshua and Caleb, that said, hey, I saw those giants. I saw the trials. I saw the effort it's going to take. But have you seen our God? Our God has promised us that land. Our God has said we can do it, so let's go for it. Now, because these two men believed in their God, their perspective was on their size of their God. Their perspective was on what they could do through God. That they got to go to the promised land. They were the only two that got to walk into the promised land because their perspective was right. So today, as we're looking at the perspective we've got, I want to encourage us not to be like the ten spies who are waiting for the timing to be right who are waiting until it feels good. But we're like the two spies, excuse me, the two spies that says, my God is bigger. So as we look at the story I want us to look at today, a journey that two people went on, we're going to be looking at the perspective they had, and we're going to see what lessons we can learn. The story we're going to look at today is actually of Abraham and Isaac, and we can find it in Genesis, um, Genesis 22, I believe it is. Yeah, Genesis 22, starting at first one. Because in this story, we have got two people who go on a journey together. It's a three-day journey, exactly the same journey, but their perspectives would have been totally different. So let's read the story first. So it's Genesis 22, starting at verse 1, where it says, After all this, God tested Abraham. God, God said, Abraham, yes, answered Abraham, I am listening. He said, Take your dear son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moab. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I point to you. Do you believe that? Take the son that you love, the son that you have waited for, and go burn him as a sacrifice to me. Bit of a tall order there. So what did Abraham do? Well, we start in verse 3. Abraham got up early the next morning, saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants and his son Isaac. He had some split wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had directed him. On the third day, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham told the two young servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over to worship, and then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to Isaac, his son, to carry. He carried the flint and the knife, and the two of them all went off together. Isaac said to, him, said to Abraham's father, Father, yes, my son, we have the flint and the wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham said, Son, God will see to it that there is a sheep for the burnt offering. So they kept on walking together. They arrived at the place to which God had directed him. Abraham built an altar, he laid out the wood, and then he tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the wood. Abraham reached out and took the knife to kill his son. Just as an angel of God, just then an angel of God called out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham! Yes, I'm listening. Don't lay a hand on that boy. Don't touch him. No, now I know that you fearfully, sorry, now I know how you fear, fearfully you fear God. You didn't hesitate to place your son, your dear son, on that altar for me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place God Yahweh, which means God sees to it. That is where we get to say, on that mountain of God, he sees to it. The angel of the Lord spoke from heaven a second time to Abraham. I swear, God's sure word, you have, sorry, you have gone through this. Sorry, I, sorry. The angel of God spoke from heaven a second time to Abraham. I swear, God's sure word, because you have gone through with this and have not refused to give me your son, your dear, dear son, I bless you. Oh, how I will bless you. And I will make sure that your children flourish like stars in the sky, like the sand on the beach, that your descendants will defeat their enemies, or the nations of earth will find themselves blessed through your descendants because you obeyed me. And then Abraham went back to his young servants. They got their things together and returned to Bathsheba. Abraham settled down in Bathsheba. So here we have the journey. It was a three-day journey that Abraham and Isaac 
had to go on. And for this journey, their perspective would have been totally different. How they viewed this journey, how they started off on this journey, they were in two totally different places. But there are three things I want us to look at today that we can learn from this journey. The first thing is that both of them had an obedient heart. They had an obedient heart. So let's first look at Abraham's perspective. Abraham, at the age of 75, was promised Isaac that he would become the father of Isaac. But he then had to wait another 25 years until he got to 100 before he became the father of Isaac. So here we have a son that has been longed after, that has been prayed over, that is cherished and loved. He represents the promises of God, the faithfulness of God. Abraham knows that he is the answer of all of God's promises to him. He is the fulfillment of the promises. And now this son that he loves, this son that he's cherished, the son that he had to wait a hundred years for, God is now saying, sacrifice him to me. Give him back to me. Imagine how Abraham must have felt. To hear those words would have been hard enough. To actually do it would have been even harder. But you see, Abraham had an obedient heart. So we can read in Genesis 22, at verse 3, that what does he do when God says, go and sacrifice your son? We are told in verse 3 that he gets up early the next morning and he goes. He goes to fulfill what God has asked him to do, even though it breaks his heart, even though it is a hard thing, a tough thing, it hurts him to even think about it. He's got an obedient heart, so he goes. He goes and he fulfills what God has asked him to do because his heart is after the things of God, because his heart longs for God, because God is number one in his life. So he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because of the obedient heart that he has. Isaac's perspective would be totally different. As his dad comes to him and says, we're going to go um, and give an offering to God. We're going to go and worship God. We're going to go up this mountain. It's a three-day journey. I want you to come with us. I'm sure what he heard is, it's a camping trip with Dad. It's great. Okay, I don't mind coming. Yeah, I'll come. He's got no idea who's coming. He has no idea what God has told Abraham to do. So when he hears about this journey, he's like, really no, why not? And he goes, and I'm sure there's a hop, skip, and a jump in his sort of journey as he's going because it's all great for him. There's no hardship for him. The journey is easy for him at this point. But as they go and they do their three-day journey, I'm sure at this point he's probably getting a little bit tired. And then it comes to a point where it's just him and his dad. And as he's talking along, now he knows enough to know what it's like to give an offering to God. He knows that to make an offering to God, you give your best. So therefore, if you're going to make a sacrifice, or you give your best lamb, or your, your best animal, whatever you're sacrificing that day, and you prepare it. But he's only thinking, and he's like, we've not prepared any lamb. We, we've not prepared anything to sacrifice. We're not carrying anything to sacrifice. This doesn't make sense. So he asks his dad, Dad, what are we going to sacrifice? We haven't got anything. And all these questions start coming to his head. And he's probably then realising actually this feels a little bit different to normal. That's not quite the same as he normally is when we're going to the place of worship. And, and I don't understand why we don't have what we normally have. And these questions are in his head. And he asks the question and the answer comes back, God will provide. And that's enough for him. Because he's like, okay, okay, dad has said it, and I trust my dad, let's go for it, let's go for it. And he keeps going despite the questions in his head. And then they get to the point where the altar is made, and then all of a sudden, imagine it, all of a sudden, the dad grabs him and starts tying him up. Now, we don't know the age of Isaac. Well, we don't know how young he was, um, but I imagine that you know, he, he wasn't a toddler at this point because he's old enough to do a three-day journey. And then when he gets to be just Abraham and Isaac, he's given the wood to carry. It would have just been a few sticks. This was enough wood to burn a sheep on, enough wood that's going to give a fire strong enough to give the um, offering to God. So it would have been a heavy load of sticks that he was carrying up a mountain. So there would have been strength in this boy. And I'm sure that as his dad grabs him and sort of starts tying him up, that his heart would be going a little bit there. That he'd have been a little bit like, what is going on? That he might be a little bit freaked out, but this is his dad. And he knows he can trust his dad. So the boy, we're not told about any struggle. We're not told about him trying to escape. But he's still there, and even though the human nature of fighting, surviving, probably would have kicked in, he'd have been like, but I trust my dad. And I, whatever he's doing, it must be for a good reason. So he gets tied up, he gets laid on the altar, he's laying there, his dad by 
noises and knives and to him. What is going through this boy's head? I'm sure it's not all peachy. I'm sure he's not thinking what a glorious day this is. He's there, but he's got an obedient heart. So he allows what to happen, what needs to happen, because of the heart the boy carries. Because you see, he's watched his dad all those years. He has been with his dad, who is obedient to God, who loves God, who serves God, who has always done the right thing by God. So this boy is there and he doesn't fight, he doesn't pull up a fight, he doesn't run back down the mountain to get away from his dad, but he's got an obedient heart. Both of these characters, Abraham and Isaac, would have had a different perspective on that journey, on what was happening, but both had an obedient heart. Abraham was obedient to what God had given and asked him to do. And Isaac was obedient to all that his dad was requiring of him because of the heart they carried. So even though they had different perspectives, they could fulfill that journey because of the heart they carried. As we see what God has got for us as a church, as we go on this journey together, we will look at it differently. We will have a different perspective, but we need to carry the heart of God. We need to carry the heart of this church, knowing that God has got a great plan for us. Because if we have an obedient heart, if we're together in heart, then we will move forward together and we are stronger together. So the first thing, a uh, different perspective that these had, is that, sorry, the first thing we can learn is that they both had an obedient heart. The second thing is they both kept going. They both kept going. So again, if we start by looking at Abraham's perspective. Here, imagine the journey. He has been told by God to sacrifice his son. He can't tell anybody else. He can't share this burden with anybody else. He's got to carry it himself. As he's on this journey, there would have been chat, there would have been talk. And Isaac would have been talking about, oh, Dad, when we get home, when we do this? Abraham doesn't know the outcome of the story. Of the story. He doesn't know what the future holds at this point. But he's got to keep going on this journey. And then when his son asked him, Dad, where's the sacrifice? To me, I imagine that being a real hit of reality, that it all came flooding back and hit him really in the face, that he's walking there and his son has been asked to sacrifice, now asks him, what are we sacrificing? That to me would have been a heart in the throat, uh, yeah, your heart in the throat situation where you're there and you're like, ah, oh, you've got to look at the son, the son that you're planning to sacrifice and say, God will provide. Because that's all that Abraham can say at this point. And I said, is that fair enough? Okay, okay. Because you see, the journey would have been tough. The journey would have been heartbreaking. The journey would have been hard for Abraham because he knew what was coming. He knew what was being asked of him. He had a hard journey. Uh, he would not have enjoyed that journey. He would have not enjoyed those three days leading up to that journey, knowing what was coming. But he kept going. As he was going up the mountain, I'm sure he was all glancing to the left and the right, trying to find him. God was providing something else to sacrifice, longing for something else to sacrifice. But he kept going, even when he didn't see it. When he made that altar, and he still saw nothing, that God had provided nothing at that point to sacrifice, he still went through what God was asking. He took his son and tied his son up. This is not a small thing. A son that he cherished, a son that he longed for, he tied up. He then got to the point of even raising a knife. He had a hard, hard journey. He hated every second of it, I'm sure, but it was something that God had asked him to do. It would have been tough, but he kept going. Isaac's perspective, as I said, when he started the journey, I imagine it all being jolly, all being great, that yes, this is fine. I can do this, I can go out with my dad, I can spend three days camping with my dad and then give him some worship and a, a sacrifice to God. They've already done it before, so he's like, come on, yeah, we can do this. He would have gone on this journey, but there was questions in his mind. Why, why was dad doing things different? I'm sure he was a little bit more quieter than normal. And why, why didn't they have what they normally have? And why this journey? Why now? And there's all these questions going on in his head. But you see, despite the questioning, despite not knowing all the answers, he kept going. He didn't at any point stop and say, do you know what, I'm, I'm tired now. We've been travelling for days. I don't quite understand what we're doing and I don't want to go any further until I know what the answers. 
That wasn't his attitude. His attitude was, I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey. I'm going with my dad. And he kept going. Even when his dad tied him up. Even when his dad was threatening his own life. He kept going. He kept true to the course that had to happen that day. Their perspectives would have been different. What they saw on that journey would have been different. But neither of them stopped. Neither of them gave up. Neither of them turned around and went back down that mountain until they had completed all that God had required of them. As we are going on this journey, there are going to be times when we feel tired. There are going to be times when we're sort of asking questions and we're not quite sure what the answers and things aren't fitting nicely in place. There may be even times when it hurts to keep going, but we need to be like Abraham and Isaac, that we keep going. We keep on this journey knowing that God has got something for us just around the river bend. Something is coming for us, but we have to keep going. So, Abraham and Isaac, both of them had an obedient heart. Both of them kept going. And the third thing that we can learn is that they both trusted in the promises of God. And this, I believe, is the power behind Abraham that kept him going, that kept him obedient, because he knew the promises of God over his life. In Genesis 17, God had promised him the promise over Isaac, where we can read, this is Genesis 17, starting at verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, God showed up and said to him, I am the strong God, live entirely before me. I'll make a covenant between you and us, and I will give you a huge family. Overwhelmed, Abraham fell flat on his face. Then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abraham, but Abraham, meaning that I make you the father of many nations. I make you the father of fathers. I make a nation from you. Kings will issue from you. I am establishing my covenant between me and you. A covenant that includes your descendants. A covenant that goes on and on and on. A covenant that commits me to, you, to be your God and the God of your descendants. And I have given you your descendants. This land where you are now camping. This whole country of Canaan to own forever and I will be their God. Jumping down to verse 15. God continued, speaking to Abraham. And so be your wife, don't call her Sarah any longer, call her Sarah. I'll bless her. Yes, I will give you a son by her. Oh, how I will bless her. Nations will come from her. Kings of nations will come from her. Abraham fell flat on his face and then laughed, thinking, Can a hundred year old father a son? Can Sarah at 90 years have a baby? Recovering, Abraham said to God, I'll keep Ishmael alive and well before you. But God said, that is not what I mean. Your wife Sarah will have a baby, a son. Name him Isaac, meaning laughter. I'll establish my covenant with him and his descendants, a covenant that will last forever. So here is a promise of God, that you are going to have a son, a son Isaac, and through this son I will fulfill my promises. Through this son that I will make you a father of nations. It is a great promise, a promise that goes into generations, generation to generation. And Abraham knows that God has promised this. He's promised this over his son Isaac, and now he's been asked to give Isaac back. But as we read in Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19, it says, By faith, Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God, acting in faith as he was ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had to receive him. And after this, sorry, and after, and this after he'd already been told, your descendants shall come from Isaac. Abraham figured that if God wanted to, he could raise the dead. In a sense, that is what happened when he received Isaac back alive from the altar. Abraham had a promise. He had a promise from God, a word from God, and this kept him obedient. This kept him with the ability to keep going, because even though he didn't fully understand what was being asked, even though the promise that he had meant that Isaac had to be alive, but now they're talking about killing Isaac, he's like, but God gave me that promise, so God knows what he's doing. If God has given me this promise, then I'm going to be obedient, because God's plans are always greater than my own. So he kept going, he kept faith in God's promises. And we can see this when they're at the mountain and they meet the 
his servants. He says to his servants, stay here. We're going to go and worship and then we will come back. Because even though he doesn't know the outcome, even though he doesn't know exactly what God is going to do, he declares the promise of God. He declares that God is going to do something through Isaac. That Isaac is a blessing, that Isaac is the fulfillment of God's promises. Therefore, they will return in some way, shape or form. They will return together. Because the promise of God meant it had to be so. He stood upon the promises of God. And this is key as we go on a journey, that we know what God is saying, that we stand upon the word of God, the promises of God, because that is what will sustain us. That is what will keep us going. Isaac's perspective um, in this, knowing that he can trust um, the promises of God. When he starts asking the questions and the answer comes back, God will provide. That's enough for him. That's enough to sort of settle that debate going on in his head that, yeah, God will provide. God will provide, and therefore he keeps going. He keeps on the journey, knowing that he can trust in the God of his dad, the God that has seen them through this far. When we go into the unknown, when we keep going forward, what is it that God is saying? What is it that God is saying to you individually? What is he saying to us as a church? Because we need to know. We need to know what God is saying so we can stand strong, so that no matter what comes our way, no matter what tries to tip us off the journey, that we can say, hang on, my God has said, and whatever God has said, that is what rules, that is what will sustain us, that is what no man can destroy, because God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing, God is faithful. We can stand upon the word of God. Do we know what God is saying to us? Abraham and Isaac's perspective um, perspective on this journey would have been totally different. For one, it meant heartache. It, it meant not knowing, it meant uh, not really understanding, but knowing they have to do what God is saying. For the other one, it was just a day out, a three day out with his dad, and then got a bit confusing at the end, but he, he kept going, and their perspectives were very different. But because both of them stayed obedient, because both of them staged the course, they kept going, and because both of them were able to stand upon the promises of God, they got a greater blessing through it. In Genesis 22, verse 15 to 18, it says, The angel of God spoke from heaven a second time to Abraham. I swear, God's sure word, because you have gone through with this and have not refused to give me your son, your dear, dear son, I bless you. Oh, how I will bless you. I will make sure that your children flourish like stars in the sky, like sand on the beaches, and your descendants will defeat their enemies. All nations on earth will find themselves blessed through your descendants because you have obeyed me. We are blessed today because Abraham was obedient, because Abraham went through with it, because Abraham didn't give up, because Isaac went on that journey and was obedient to what his dad was asking of him. We sit here today blessed because of an obedience of a man. Because you see, when we see God's plans through, there is a great blessing in it. And it's not just for you and me, but it's for us all. As a church, for the streets out there, for our communities, when we act as God wants, it's always bigger than just our little lives. It goes beyond us. It goes out to those that we touch, to those that see us, to those that we can reach, because God's plans are bigger than us, bigger than we can ever perceive for ourselves. Our perspectives, they may be different. We will see things different. Some of you might be glass half empty people. That when you see things, you see the negative first. You, you see the troubles first. You see what the hardship might be. And the temptation will be to be like those ten spies that are just sitting going, just gonna wait for a better time. I'm just gonna wait. And you know what? If you are somebody that sees the negative first, that's not a bad thing. The bad thing is if you let it sit you down, if you let it stop you. Because who you are is who God created you to be. But you need to take responsibility in who you are. And you need to be people that are willing to rise up. And even though everything in you is telling you just to wait until the timing is better, that first you look and see what God is saying. That you keep going and you're an obedient heart to God. And then your people that will rise up because you know the promises of God are beyond what you can see. The promises of God are bigger than to wait for everything to be perfect. Others of us in this room, we might be glass half empty, where we see things and straight away we go, yes, come on. We know that good things are going to come from this. We know that God can use this. We know that something great is going to come from this conversation or from this opportunity. And we get excited over things. And if that's us, then we need to be people that are willing to take people on the journey with us. That we help 
don't join really people up and say, come on, we can do this, that we speak it out, we declare it so that people can hear our journeys. We are all going to see things different, whether we see it from a glass half empty or a glass half full. Whether we see the do's and don'ts first or we just see the potential first, we are all different. And we rejoice over the fact that we are all different. We need each other. We need to do this journey together. And even though our perspectives will be different, even though we will see different things, we move forward together. We move forward with obedient hearts. We move forward and we keep going. And we move forward knowing what God is saying to us as individuals and as a church, knowing that God has got this. So church, I invite you today to come on a journey with us, to see what God is saying, to see what God is doing, knowing that something is just around the riverbed, that something is coming, and we can get excited. We can start talking about it now. We can start thinking about what God is doing. We can stir ourselves to rise up, to know that we are people that God has called for such a time as this. For now, as we come out of lockdown, what is it that God is saying to us? And then with obedient hearts, we keep going and we stand upon the promises of God. Now, I'm just going to ask the worship group to come back up as they finish in their song of rise. But I'm going to pray for us as a church. I'm going to pray that we embrace this journey, that we keep going, that we hear what God is saying, and that together we move forward mightily in the things of God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you've got a plan for us. I thank you that there is something coming. I thank you that you are a good, faithful God. So I pray you help each one of us, no matter what our perspective may be, that you'll help us to hear your voice first. You'll help us to keep going and to be obedient to what you're asking us to do. That you'll help us to hear and understand your promises on our life. That, Father God, you'll bring back to mind what you've already declared, what you've already said over us, so that we stand strong, that we keep going, and that we embrace this time. That, Father God, we know something is coming. We know something's coming just around the river bend, and we declare it today in faith. We declare it knowing that your goodness will go before us, that you have plans for us that are bigger than each one of us. And we thank you in faith. We thank you today for what you're going to be showing us, for what you're going to be saying to us, and for where you're taking us. We thank you, Father God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's just stand. Talk about our God. Sing about our God.